Right, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Raymond Helpak. I'm a neurologist, neurointensivist from Innsbruck Medical University in Austria. And I'm um, leading a 16 bed neuro ICU. And uh, obviously, I do have lots to do with comatose patients. And um, in this next uh, 30 minutes, uh, feel free to ask questions. And you see, the agenda, there are so many things we can talk about in comatose patients. Uh, I will stress some points, but I'm totally open and flexible. If you have several questions, just go ahead and um, ask me, even interrupt me. This is my conflict of interest. Um, the, it was uh, 2018 when we came together from the Neurocritical Care Society and I was the European representative uh, to think about what the next theme of the Neurocritical Care Society going to be. And we decided um, the theme of coma. And that's why we started the campaign named Curing Coma Campaign. And it's obvious that we never cure coma, but uh, we can put a lot of our academic thoughts about uh, the clinical thoughts into that program and that actually happened uh, already in the last uh, four years we created uh, groups uh, who are working on totally different parts uh, summarizing lit the literature for example uh, summarizing the gaps in knowledge and uh, I'm responsible for the prospective study, uh, studies group, so I'm, I'm leading the prospective studies group, uh, which is an international group focusing on which direction also clinical trials are going to go in future. So if we talk about coma, uh, coma comes from the Greek word coma, and it actually means deep sleep. And there's a nice uh, story about carotis. We know that these are the arteries. Um, uh, we now say arterial carotis, but uh, there was a, a, a link in the Greek between the compression of the carotis and drowsiness. So if you, if you compress or, or, uh, the carotis, then the patient worsened. And so there's also a link in carotis um, and coma. And uh, we, we now, we, we see the word coma from Hippocrates and, and then afterwards, and we now have this definition of coma. So the patient has to be unresponsive. The patient should not open the eyes. There's lots of discussion about that because also uh, sometimes if patients are brain deaf, they slightly open the eyes and that's why an academic discussion started about uh, that topic. Uh, is there an eye open coma? I'm totally against it, but uh, uh, I understand the thought uh, and it's an, it's an academic discussion. Per definition, the eyes uh, are closed. The patient cannot be aroused, um, but you can see some movements. And these movements, um, you may know from the brain death patients. They all look the same. It's very difficult if you, if you go for plantar responses, Babinski signs, for example, you see the movement. Um, and that movement can actually be uh, very, very dramatic, like um, the Lazarus sign where the patient is, is nearly sitting up and uh, the, moving the arms. And that's very difficult to understand for the relatives. But uh, things like that can happen. And this is on the, on the spinal uh, part, but not not uh, reflected to the brain. So Plum and Posner's uh, definition, I think, is very important, but uh, it gets more and more uh, challenged. And why? Uh, the good thing, it's a, it's a clinical definition. You don't need any, any EG analysis. You don't need any, any fMRI or sophisticated tool. It's a clinical definition. And I think uh, that's, that's a huge benefit. But if we think about, for example, epilepsy, we say epilepsy is not epilepsy. So we define uh, epilepsy by describing what we see, by the etiology, by uh, potential mechanisms which drive, uh, drives us to prognosis, and also by time, for example. 
And this is not not included in the definition of coma. And I think uh, one of the important next steps is that we enlarge this definition of coma. What do you what do we mean by coma? Though? Is uh, coma those patients? Is there a def the, uh, definition of time? Is a certain time needed? Uh, we know that there are several causes of coma which are reversible. If you hypoglycemic coma. It's reversible. You just have to give glucose, and there, there are so many. We're going to discuss about the causes as well, and um, other other things which are uh, scientifically wise, also very important. Which brain structures uh, are involved in patients who are comatose compared to those who are not? And obviously, if you have if you have a huge bleeding, it's very easy to to see these lesions and uh, to understand why that patient is comatose. But sometimes it's on the cellular level, and you don't see any sophisticated neuroimaging findings. But still, the patient is unconscious and uh, could be uh, comatose. And um, the point I'm going to discuss later on, uh, non-clinical definition, so uh, neuroimaging and uh, obviously electrophysiology are very important nowadays because we, we identify patients who are actually not comatose per definition because we see signals and that's, that's part um, of the future. So this is a very, very uh, well-known and nice uh, scheme about um, the evolution of coma to full recovery, what you can see here. And although this is a straight line, it never uh, goes the direction of the straight line. And you see here uh, the terminus of uh, cognitive motor dissociation. Uh, we kind of discussed it uh, in detail later, but the definition is that the patient is not moving. It looks like the patient is comatose, but we have some signals, either in EG or fMRI, and we see that, that the patient is still uh, show, reacting to external stimulus, but not by, by movement, not by purposeful movement. And this is, this is this terminus, which more and more comes in literature, and it's quite an interesting patient population because uh, we would misclassify this patient population, uh, especially in the acute phase. So uh, also uh, in our group as part of the uh, prospective studies group and uh, the Curing Coma campaign, we tried to uh, summarize our thoughts in a paper and propose a new score. Obviously that score um, is not, not to be used. It's more you can read the paper and you can, you can uh, think about the ideas and uh, which direction uh, we want to go in terms of definition and what's going to be important. And you see the clinical phenotype here. And we have uh, the coma recovery scale revised, um, which we, which is recommended to use, uh, especially in patients if they recover from from comatose state. And then we add additional information, which is not the Plum and Postner definition. So neuroimaging, for example, we add another dimension of EEG, MRI, PET analysis, and then we come up to a new score where we include include cognitive motor dissociation. And that score um, was proposed by David Mannon, who is a genius guy in, in um, the whole campaign. And uh, you, you can just look it up. Uh, it could, it's obviously, whenever you introduce a new score, it's too complicated. Uh, uh, no one wants, wants to apply it. It's very difficult. It could be that it's more a research tool in future, but um, I think it totally makes sense to include more information. And then there, there is a third dimension, and this uh, third dimension um, is more a visionary dimension because um, patients will um, show improvement or worsening uh, in the trajectory from coma to recovery. And y you will see a structural damage more or less. You have the clinical phenotype and you have function. Function, for example, like, like EG. Um, and the patient is somewhere in, in that box and can uh, improve, can deteriorate again and then improve again. So it, it totally makes sense, especially in the rehabilitation setting, setting in, in the prolonged um, setting, taking care of comatose patients to 
communicate the state of the patient. And that's now very difficult because you, you just say minimal conscious state plus or minus and you, you have these rough categories. But uh, it's very difficult to understand what actually the prognosis of that patient is. And that, that makes uh, the whole campaign actually, to my mind, useful that uh, international people are working together. We have uh, uh, two weeks uh, uh, telephone conferences and think about, the, uh, uh, think about the next step and the evolution. So the question, do we agree on the definition of coma? And we made the um, survey, the come together survey in among healthcare professionals. And there's a huge limitation that uh, most of the respondents were physician and came from academic centers. But uh, maybe that's also quite informative because we were very, very much disappointed to see that the agreement on the definition is very low. Only 65% agreed on, on what we proposed that the definition of coma should be. Um, and if you go through that, no command following, I think that's clear, but not 100%. This is the, the percentage of, pay, uh, of participants who, who agreed. So not 100% agreed, and there were even 25% disagreeing uh, to that definition. So that's, that's, that's what we have. So it could be that, that it needs more education. Um, and uh, so the, the message maybe has to be spread more, more precisely. And then you have all these other um, definitions, no intelligible uh, uh, gesture. I think that's, that's also per definition um, a, a very important uh, clinical sign um, of comatose patients, no volitional uh, movement and no visual pursuit. So um, fixation is something which comes uh, to the de definition of minimal consciousness state plus, for example. You put the mirror on the patient and you see the patient if the patient is following or not. That's a very, very good uh, uh, clinical information. And um, we also put the information of COVID consciousness here, cognitive motor dissociation, um, uh, in the definition. And we also found that there is not a huge agreement. And then uh, the next question was, um, you can pick any of these parts, uh, how to define coma. And uh, we got the most agreement on the absence of wakefulness. This is the highest uh, agreement uh, we got. And maybe we have to simplify and, and just say, well, this patient is not reacting. And uh, that's the easy classification for the community to uh, say that this, is, this patient is comatose. But um, as I alluded to already, uh, I think we have to go the step, uh, like in epilepsy, status epilepticus, to define more about etiology, about the time, about the cause, and the, about the prognosis. So what causes coma? I think that's that's also very uh, important. Um, and uh, since many, many hundred thousands of years, it was clear that there's structural damage, damage and also toxic causes of uh, coma. So this is a study um, of the emergency uh, setting. Uh, I think it was uh, Charité Hospital in, in Berlin. And uh, they looked up uh, patients with coma of unknown origin who presented in the emergency setting. And obviously, um, the etiology of coma is totally different from one country to the other country because if you have, for example, uh, also CNS infectious diseases, uh, uh, then, then you might include this as important etiology for um, unconsciousness in the, in the uh, emergency setting. But the interesting information uh, for me was that um, there were a certain number of patients, so more than 10%, were with a rapid recovery. And so we can say this is a transient state of coma. And the striking information on that is that there is still a very high mortality in this patient population. And just uh, uh, think about that, it's the hypoglycemic coma, it's, it's, a, it's a very broad etiology and you can go through that slide and you see the different causes, what can actually cause coma. Um, that's that's uh, also a very nice paper. Uh, how complex the situation is. And if, if you know that, how, how um, intoxication, for example, it's, it's not only the brain injury. 
uh, if we asked our participants uh, more focused on brain injury. So intracerebral hemorrhage as cause, traumatic brain uh, um, injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and so on, and so on, and so on, cardiac arrest. But uh, if, you, if you go actually into detail what can, can cause unconsciousness, what can cause a comatose state, it's uh, much more complex. Obviously, we um, have to understand why is the patient not awake. And there are two systems which are very important. It's the reticular ascending system, what you can see here, also in these, in these colors, and going up to the thalamus and the thalamus uh, 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 connecting to the uh, front, forebrain, frontal cortex, and uh, uh, the whole brain. So this system somehow is called arousal system. So this is needed, the function is needed um, that a patient can actually be awake. So if we have damage, uh, somewhere, structural damage, and I'm showing you um, brain MRI images um, where uh, after traumatic brain injury you see these bleeding, small bleedings, larger bleedings, and it totally depends on where these bleedings are, uh, uh, um, and especially if they are in the, in the brainstem, like here, if the patient has the possibility to wake up or not. And it's not, it's not quantifying the lesion, it more makes uh, the, the importance uh, where the lesion actually is. And especially, there's a new classification for diffuse axonal injury, published also in, in, in neurology a few years ago, which uh, says that these grading one, two, three, what, what we usually use is not correct because uh, it could be a minor lesion in a very sensitive area and the patient has a very poor prognosis. And uh, that's why uh, it, it's so important to, to think about where consciousness derives from and which network do we need for patients uh, to be awake. These are two other examples. Uh, uh, you see these bilateral thalamic infarction. I don't know whether you have uh, seen patients like that. These are patients who usually are in a sleepy state for weeks, but they have a good prognosis. You just have to know that uh, they, they, they even react on, on EEG, but they sleep. And, and this um, uh, sleepy state can be for, for weeks, but they will improve. And this is usually seen if you have bilateral thalamic in, infarction. Another case also uh, more severe with this uh, infarction here in the thalamus, but we also have toxic causes. Uh, maybe um, what, what is prominent here is a two, uh, T2 image, um, and you see this hyper-intense lesion, lesion in around the equiduct, which is a very sensitive re, uh, uh, region for arousal and also in the thalamus. Maybe someone has an idea what the etiology of that uh, patient is, a very symmetric pathology, and uh, we usually see edema around. Does someone have an idea what what that, uh, I, I say, somehow toxic uh, etiology could be? Pardon? A bit louder? Uremic? Um, um, not, not necessarily in that, in that area. Uh, I, would, I would put that more to the white matter and not, not, not in that area. It's a vitamin B1 deficiency. And uh, that's, that's uh, quite common that people, uh, if, if we look in the MRI scan, if you look in the CT scan, you will not see anything. But uh, in MRI scan, Vernica encephalopathy, in, in the, the more severe cases, looks like that. And you see these bitalamic uh, uh, lesions, but also, actually, they have a rather good prognosis. Most of these are, these are uh, um, patients with chronic alcohol ab uh, abuse, and they have uh, other... Um, clinical symptoms and signs which, which um, uh, actually um, uh, influence the prognosis, but uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, awakening, um, this has a good prognosis if it's vitamin B1 def deficiency and uh, adequately substituted. So how common is coma? 
And uh, we also reviewed the literature and we didn't find any study which, uh, which shows us how, how many patients are comatose. Is that, is that a huge problem? So we uh, also started an, a crowdsourcing study um, in uh, the current coma campaign. And crowdsourcing um, is nowadays possible in UK and US. And uh, you, you just create a CRF of questions and then it's going to be sent to um, uh, an unselected uh, population which have to be uh, registered in uh, for this, these questions and they usually get a, a certain amount of money for answering uh, questions. And that's what we did and we asked uh, just uh, do you have uh, were you admitted on, on uh, yourself in coma in your life? Was someone of your family in the last year, in the last 12 months, admitted um, in a comatose state? Was someone of a second degree uh, family member admitted? And that's uh, how we came to the numbers. We reached out to more than uh, 2,000 people. We reached out altogether to 30,000 um, uh, relatives, family members, healthy family members, and there uh, we got an estimation how common coma is in the population. And the message is, it's, it's as common as sepsis, it's as common as traumatic brain injury. So uh, and now we have at least a, a, certain, a certain number where we can say, well, it absolutely makes sense to put effort and to treat uh, these patients and to invest in the campaign. So how to assess comatose patients? Uh, I think clinical exam is uh, very important. Um, I just gonna go go through that a bit faster because I recognize uh, the time. Uh, clinical exam, we use the GCS and uh, um, preferably the four score. The four score integrates also the pupil size and also the breathing. Um, in, in blood examination, we had a wonderful talk from uh, David Menon and that was, um, we, we don't have a biomarker for classifying coma. That's very important. We use it for prognostication, also for the severity of injury, but not for classification of coma. And obviously, electrophysiology is something uh, we need in the definition and in the workup for comatose patients. So uh, the additional point I would like uh, to make is that clinical exam is of utmost importance. Even if the patient is sedated, even if the patient is in a kind of comatose state, go for clinical exam. And I think uh, the time is here and I want to make, make that point. You had a very nice uh, uh, lecture about the use of uh, pupillometry. And I think uh, we now know that, that uh, we are very bad in what we do in terms of um, the pupil reactivity on the patient bedside in assessing that uh, in communicating how uh, large the pupil actually is. And we have these automatic devices which give, give us objective data. And the largest publications are in cardiac arrest. And uh, the, the, there are now many, many papers as listed here that um, this information in the first 24, 48, uh, 72 hours is very predictive for prognosis. And that's why um, it was also very recently included um, and what you can see here is the use of an automated pupillometer. And I think um, this is something uh, where um, nurses are happy if they don't have to, to um, estimate anything anymore. And we also know that uh, if we take the information from, uh, from uh, our estimation on nurses, in 20% we do a wrong job but it also depends on the pupil size and that's important in comatose patients. In some patients you have a very small pupil size, uh, uh, especially also in pontine lesions. Pontine pupils are very thin, very small um, uh, pupils and um, you still have to know whether, whether there is a reactivity or not. And you will not be able to see that with your, your eyes, but uh, with the automated device, uh, you will see it. And especially in that, in, in that small size, you see that our f rate of classifying um, the patient wrongly is very, very high. So um, I'm going to go to the 
I, I want to leave some time for all right. So what what about treatment? Um, and I think so. We we don't we don't have a bullet uh, a pharmacological treatment which actually solves the whole problem. Um, and this this slide is uh, important because uh, we do have a study on amantadine in, in TBI patients. The original study is actually in subacute TBI patients um, to to give amantadine and to try uh, to influence the excitatory system and to help uh, patients waking up. And uh, this is something we, in clinical use, we now extend also to stroke patients and to other patient population that we, we give amantadine um, in these patient population, also in the subacute phase in the ICU, in the process of waking up. Otherwise, we don't have a good drug. Also, uh, some other drugs um, worked in some patients, and there were, were nice reports uh, in literature, but uh, it's not recommended uh, for general use. So the, the future, um, that's uh, just a few slides on, on what happens in the brain in uh, seemingly comatose patients. Uh, it could be that, that we see activation um, by uh, telling the patient, this is the first patient description, um, go, go back to your home, think that you're going to the kitchen, think that you're going to your bedroom, you see activation, think about playing tennis, you see activation. Um, and that's, that was actually a very uh, a big step towards classifying or rethinking um, the prognosis or the existence of activity in the brain um, in uh, seemingly comatose patients. And this is uh, the other study I would like to mention. Uh, it's an EG monitoring, and I think this is also a landmark study of Jan Klaassen. Uh, the idea was uh, go to the ICU and provide um, a stimulus to the patient, and the stimulus was a verbal stimulus. Just uh, uh, open, open your hand, close your hand, open your hand, close your hand, and then nothing. And then again, open your hand, close your hand. And what he identified is that there are 15% of, of comatose patients which show an EEG reactivity. And this patient population was the patient population who uh, largely improved afterwards, meaning one out of six patients where we would classify that this is uh, comatose patients with, with a very poor prognosis. In, um, uh, uh, future directives, I would say that, because EG is not very easy, so it could be uh, the way to go in terms of classifying, identifying this patient population. So to end up my talk, um, I want to promote one study which, which we are initiating right now. It's the COMPOSE study. If uh, you're interested to participate, you can reach out to me or, or uh, also the Neurocritical Cr uh, Care Society uh, to the um, uh, Curing Coma campaign. It's the COMPOSE study where we, this is a very pragmatic study. And we would like to have the information, what causes coma? how do patients manage comatose patient and it's more yes or no do you do, do you use eg in that patient yes or no and and maybe how often but it's not not going too much into detail and we also ask for outcome hospital discharge is the minimum but then also for a six months uh, one year or two years outcome which is not mandatory but uh, which uh, provides us an actual uh, information about what is going on in the real life situation and we will include only only a few hospitals per country, actually only one per country, uh, and would like to have a worldwide coverage. So if you're interested, uh, please, um, you can reach me via email or uh, the Curing Coma campaign. And having said that, um, I'm, I, I hope that I could uh, open your mind towards what is coma and uh, which direction um, we move in in future uh, in terms of research and also uh, clinical clinically uh, how we we see the trajectory of comatose patients which actually also brings us into a very ethical difficult uh, situation but i think it's important uh, for the benefit of our patients if there are any questions, I'm happy to take these questions in the last minute. Thank you very much.